I want to thank everyone for coming to the Fall Judaic Studies um, lecture. Every year we like to put on a lecture around the time of uh, commemoration of the Holocaust, Kristallnacht. It's also right near Veterans Day. So this year um, I'm happy to be able to do uh, combine them both. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us, excuse my voice, uh, Robert Max. He comes to us from New Jersey. He's going to tell his story. I mean, he is one of what we now know as the greatest generation, a real American hero. Uh, I don't need to really introduce him because, uh, as I said, he will tell the story other than say that he's been uh, s since the war, and you'll hear about the war, he's been a very successful businessman, philanthropist, community leader in New Jersey. Uh, but we're bringing him here to speak about events when he was the age of all you guys. Um, we don't have many left to tell these stories, heroes like this uh, from that war, the Great War, oh, not World War II, but the greatest generation. Now uh, they called World War I the Great War. And without any further ado, I'm going to call on Robert Max. He will speak for about 45 minutes and then answer questions. So uh, Robert Max, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Thank you for being here. I uh, was telling Dr. Shapiro earlier tonight that uh, for my wife and me, this is like a homecoming for us. And he said well, we're from New Jersey, and that's true. But for many years, we had a home on, in the Poconos, on Lake Wall and Paw Pack. And the big city was Scranton. You know, we came here for all of our entertainment. So now we're, we're further in New Jersey, so we go to New York for entertainment. But this served very well during the days that we were up around Lake Wall and Paul Pack. Uh, I want to begin by giving you some numbers which will become relevant when I get into talk, talking about some of the things that I experienced. And Dr. Shapiro mentioned that, uh, as Tom Brokaw said, we, people my age, we were part of the great, great, greatest generation. And possibly in our conversation or possibly in your questions later on, we can get into what America was like during that period of World War II, before, and of course after, afterward too. But it was, we were a different nation at that time. We were a different people. And circumstances, I think, dictated what we had become. So we can get into that later on in the questions. But let me, let me give you some numbers, which will become more relative later on. <coughs> During World War II, 60 million people lost their lives. 18 million people lost their lives, were killed during the Holocaust. Of those 18 million, 6 million were Jews. <clears throat> One third of the world's Jewish population. Two thirds of the Jewish population in Europe was wiped out. Those figures will become meaningful as you understand that I was an American Jewish uh, soldier in World War II. Four days after, December 1st, December 7th, 1941, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Four days later, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Germany in Germany <sighs> declared war on the United States. So here we were a nation that was totally isolationist at the time. And suddenly, we recognized that we were in a war we never wanted, but couldn't avoid. Shortly into, uh, just, just barely into the uh, next year, I did what most people did. That was in 1942. I did what most people my age did. We volunteered to go to war. We volunteered to go into service with the expectation that we would serve in the war. And so I received basic training and then combat training in the United States, and then shipped out overseas on the SS Mauritania. Mauritania was a luxury liner, a British luxury liner. <clears throat> and what happened, to get troops over quickly, most of the great ocean liners converted to troop transports. And so we were put on a ship like that. I had the privilege for five or, or six nights of sleeping in a hammock crossing the Atlantic Ocean in a bar, what was the ship's bar. The only problem was it was dry, but it did get me there. 
we, one of the things that the Nazis had been able to achieve during that period was to cover the Atlantic, the bottom of the Atlantic in reality, with its submarines. So when the ships went from America to uh, Britain, they, were, they we, weaved back and forth across the ocean. We got to Liverpool in England and looked down from the deck as, we, as, we, as the ship docked. And the people were holding up newspapers that said, Mauritania sunk. And we, we were standing there, though, and we had to convince the people that we were the Mauritania. Of course, the, the sign indicated that. But we were the Mauritania, and we were here. We trained more in Europe, in uh, England, rather. We crossed the English Channel and landed on Omaha Beach. Now, the uh, war began in Europe on... Um, June 6, 1944, with the big landing, D-Day, which you possibly are familiar with. But D-Day was the first entry of the American forces into Europe and into battle in Europe. And I landed a few weeks afterward. And uh, I remember coming off. You came up, you, we went over in Liberty ships and then had to climb down nets with everything we owned on our backs and then land in an LST. You probably have seen pictures of those ships as they came as far into shore as they could, and then the big door came down and troops came running off into water up to their chests. On D-Day, some of those troops actually drowned because they had all their equipment on their backs and the ships couldn't get in far enough. And so some of them were in, in water over their heads and couldn't swim with all that equipment on. But anyway, we did make our way to shore, climbed the mountains there, and I just, I, I just couldn't possibly imagine how those troops landed on D-Day because there was bunker after bunker and there were guns mounted. I aimed and pointed down at them and I said, under that kind of fire, how could they have done it? Well, the reality was that many, many lives were lost. We climbed, I fought in France in three major battles. The last of the battles that I was in was in the Ardennes Forest, which was in uh, Be Belgium. And uh, there I was with the 6th Armored Infantry Division of George Patton's 3rd Army. I was in Company A, which means that we were at the point of all attacks. On December 16, 1944, the, the, culm the culminating event of World War II, the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. And the Germans, it was their last major thrust. They threw everything they could at the Allied forces. And the Allies drew back. I was with, again, with, a with this uh, armored infantry company. I'd been on the line for three days and then came back behind the lines for some food, a little rest. And someone said, that we've lost contact with our lines. We don't know where they are anymore. Radio contact has been destroyed. And so we need somebody to go out and find out where our allied lines are. And one of the things that we were always told, never volunteer, but at my age, and uh, I, I, I saw no, no other thing to do but than th to volunteer. That was, what, that was what we were supposed to do. So I did, I got into a Jeep and uh, asked for other guys to join me and they did. They jumped in the back of the Jeep. So there we took off down the road, a Jeep with a machine gun mounted on it and five or six other guys. We thought we would come across our allied lines. We would, call, we would see our American troops. We didn't. Instead, as we rounded a turn in the road, we were faced with a distance of about from here to that wall with a 88 millimeter cannon mounted on a Nazi tank pointed directly at us. At any moment, someone might have fired that and we would have been finished. I slammed on the brakes in the Jeep. We slid across the road into a ditch and we spied across the road. There was a little shack. We didn't know what was on our right, but we did see on the left, at least there was a shack someplace where we could get some refuge. And so what we did, we raced across the road to this shack. One of, the, one of our people was shot on the way over. We got into the shack. This was early in the morning. 
And we began to, a battle. We used our, it was all small arms fire. We did have a machine gun we took from the Jeep. We, in the shack, it was a big bay window. And uh, the man who was in front of the machine gun in that bay window was hit. You do things in combat that sometimes are instinctive. And in better judgment, you would say, not wise to do. But nevertheless, I did get in front of that machine gun and fired. I was, I was a perfect target. Fortunately, did not get hit. Did fire and shoot and probably killed a number of the Nazis who were on the other side. We had no idea what the forces were that were mounted against us. But nevertheless, we had no choice. We had to try to fight our way out of that. We did that for an entire day. Our ammunition ran out <clears throat> and uh, we, we dwindled our fire. And then the perfect strategy, what we will do, having discovered that there was a trap door in this shack, those few of us remaining will climb down into the trap door, uh, into the cellar, and then wait, let them bypass us, and then we will infiltrate at night. Unfortunately, when I lifted that, the, the cover of that cellar, I saw a sight that I will remember forever. One of the things under those circumstances, there's some things that you, uh, that you forget completely. Other things that are very fuzzy in your mind, but some stick in your mind forever. And that sight I will never forget. I looked up and saw that we were surrounded by a ring of black automatic guns. They were they called burp guns. And behind each of the guns was a white cloaked Nazi soldier, white, white for the combat against the snow. <clears throat> uh, they might have shot us there. And in reality, they could have, because the orders issued from high command at that point was that no Allied prisoners were to be taken alive any longer. But for some reason, they asked us to come up. We came up. And uh, they took the others away. They asked me to stay with them and show them that there were no booby traps in this shack. Then I was escorted across the road. I had an opportunity to see what we had been up against. And there was, was bunker after bunker lined up down the road. And uh, the estimate was maybe somewhere between 100 and 200 soldiers that we were battling against. So we were fortunate at least to have gotten that far. How much further we would get, who knew? I was put under the control of a German sergeant. When we crossed the road, he went down into his bunker. Why? Because American shell fire that we had called for early in the morning started to come in. And we were in a field with lots of trees. So what happens is you get your shell, you get tree blasts, and you get uh, 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 shrapnel falling all around you. And so I asked to come in to the uh, bunker. And he said, nine, nine, nine. nine. And so the next step was what? Try to escape somehow. I looked down that road. Now it was already evening, so it was dark. And uh, I looked toward the road. I had been a sprinter in high school. And I figured, now's the time. If you, you got all that training there, you were a good sprinter, now go. And I looked down the road, and there were all these bunkers, <clears throat> and with a machine gun on each one, and I realized I would not get very, very far because there was a burning tank in the field and that tank lit up the road. I would not get far at all. And that didn't leave me much choice, no alternatives other than conversation. And so I started to talk to this German sergeant. And he understood enough English so that we could make ourselves understood. He said, why are you here? He said, this is not your war. And I said, you made it our war, of course. And the discussion went on. In essence, it became a debate. You look back and you say, how in the world would, that, would all that happening, on the one hand, the threat that in all likelihood your life will be taken anyway, and the other, I hear these shells landing all around so you don't feel very comfortable. But somehow, something in you instinctively enables you to talk and maybe even to become rational. 
For some reason, <clears throat> and it's hard to explain this, in all of the Nazi ground soldiers, I may have come across one of the very, very few who was also a military humanitarian, if you will. We talked and we talked and we talked. And finally I said to him, I said, what are you going to do with me? And he said, I have to kill you. And I thought certainly he was going to do that. He didn't. The conversation went on. A little while later, he then, in the conversation, he pulls out a wallet and he opens it and he shows me a picture of his family. And he has two handsome children. And he says to me, <clears throat> next year, we are all going to be in New York City. Anyone who doubts that Adolf Hitler and his master plan had any design less than taking over the entire world should well understand that was part of his master plan. And of course, here was verification of, of sorts right on the battlefield. And this guy says, no, he was convinced. There's no question about it. He did not know that the battle had turned and the Allied forces had regrouped and now we're going to be charging back. But they did have that mental attitude and approach that they were going to conquer the United States. So those of us who were, who at the time were isolationist, certainly anyone who had been privy to what I just heard there would have known that that was the intention all along. And were it not for a president with huge vision, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill in, in Britain, their vision, of course, was that, first of all, Britain had to be saved before the United States entered the war. The Americans predominantly were opposed to supporting the British. It was their war, not ours. But Roosevelt, using guile and some fact, tried to convince the American people that we had to save Britain. And even before the Nazis declared war on the US, he started what was called the Lend-Lease Program. And the idea, basically very simple, we would keep Britain afloat because there was no question the Nazis would cross the English Channel and Britain would be defeated. And if Britain was, all Europe had been, there was nothing left but to continue west. And the United States would have been under attack through submarines and, and aircraft and the like. <clears throat> and so, here we are under these circumstances and the uh, Sergeant then looks up at me and he says, you know, for you the war is over. Now at that point I thought certainly he was, certain he was going to pull his gun and, and shoot me. But no, this was the, humani the military humanitarian coming out. I can't imagine a soldier doing this other than one who had respect for gallantry on the, in the battlefield. And he said, you fought well, you and your, your men, you fought well today. You killed many of our people, but I, I, I respect you for the battle you fought, and I am going to send you back to a prisoner of war camp. And it was his impression at that time that in a prisoner of war camp, you would serve out the time till the end of the war, not have to be in combat, have food and shelter and all those wonderful things. But he called over two guards. They took me away at gunpoint with the instruction to go to a POW camp. That wasn't to be. They had different orders, and those orders were to thrust any Allied prisoner they caught at that point into slave labor. You became an expendable. expendable. You, you, your life meant nothing at all. Geneva Convention meant nothing to these people. They were given an assignment to have their railroads rebuilt. And how, who was going to rebuild them? The Allied prisoners. And you either worked or you died. Or if you were able, if you could look like you were working and sabotage, then that was even better. And that essentially is what, what I did. I, I managed to keep looking like I was working. We never really completed anything. that The Nazis could use and put trains on we did have to carry railroad tracks, though, from, time, from town to town, usually at nights. And that was not pleasant. 
you know, on a raw shoulder carrying these heavy railroad tracks. We did have to do that. But anyway, that was the assignment, work or die. Now, when, uh, when I was captured, they took my winter coat away. Temperatures at that time were somewhere between zero and five degrees Fahrenheit. I was told it was the coldest winter in Germany for many, many years. And so, no winter garments and no shelter. They had no plan for putting us into any kind of a building where there would be any degree of warmth or, or any shelter at all. And so there we were, force marched and required to sleep on cold, cold ground, snow, ice, anything at all. On occasion, we were fortunate. And uh, they did put us in a cold, unheated barn for the night. But mo mo much of the time, though, we slept outdoors. So we had this constant exposure. I'm telling you this, and I'm, I'm going to indicate the kind, of, the kind of, what shall I say, life you were forced to live under the na Nazis. And if we wonder why so many perished and so many were injured and spent the rest of their lives, really, with those, those injuries, these are the kind of things that led to that. So we, we, we lived under constant exposure for months, slept outdoors most of the time, and no winter garments. We began to lose people for malnutrition. Your body can go without food only so long. And you burn those calories and they're gone and you have no resources at all. So we began to lose people along the way. The rule was very simple. Again, you worked or you died. Some who could not get up and capable of working were shot. In fact, I testified at the end of the war against a German sergeant whose name happened to be Eisenhower. And we remember Eisenhower led the Allied forces in Europe during that war, but it was spelled H-A-U, not instead of H-O-W-E-R. And uh, I remember his shooting this person because he, he couldn't get up at all. So the body deteriorated and uh, many died, again, from, from malnutrition and exposure. And uh, some from beatings. We did have beatings. I just got rifle butts in the back, but no real beatings. But some of them did. And some actually shot. One of the most difficult things to do, and as I say, all this time, that was our, our responsibility was to rebuild the railroads. We really didn't. I can't remember that anybody ever constructed anything other than dragging those, those railroad ties, uh, tracks rather, <coughs> from town to town. I can't remember that anybody ever really did anything that was of value to them. Remember, the Allied planes bombed the railroads regularly, and that was our job to put them back into shape. So we went on and on. Food was negligible to, uh, to nothing. There were two places where we stopped, and we did get some food. One was in Prum, Germany. It was a slave labor camp of sorts. We just passed through it. The food we got there were six one inch in diameter crackers. That was it for the day. And then we went on later, we passed through another town, a slave labor area, Gerolstein, Germany. And there, the food got a little better. At least there was some heat. We got a metal can with some hot water with a piece of potato in it. And they called it soup. There was no flavor to it, but that was it, sustenance for the day. And so you can see how rapidly we lost weight, we lost flesh, we lost strength, and all, and all of that. One of the most difficult things to deal with at that time was the bombings from our own planes. When you're 10,000 feet in the air, very difficult to distinguish the people on the ground. So while they, and, and the Germans knew that, so they would put us into forced marches during the day rather than at night. Our own planes coming from England would swoop down and they would bomb and shoot, fire at us, and we lost many people that way. One of the most discouraging parts of it, though, was the mental, mental uh, effect that it had on us. And try to imagine this. Again, you're living in these conditions. You don't have the clothing, and there's the snow and, and, uh, and ice on the, on the ground, and you're forced to work. You don't have any vision of food, drink, or much of anything else. And you see those planes going, and then making the loop, 
heading back to England. And it's, in a way, it's demoralizing, it's frustrating, and all that. And you say, you know, what, what's it all about? They're going back to the officers' club, and you know they're going to have a good meal, and a drink, and a cigar, and all that. It becomes very frustrating. Mental attitude under those conditions, extremely important, could only be attained by people who were young enough and healthy enough to be able to create some positive thinking. Will I get out of this? And I've be often been asked by people, I said, did you, at any time, did you ever give up? And I don't recall that I ever did because I always figured I had three options. One, the war will end. Two, maybe I can escape. And three, when, when I lie on the ground at night, again, mostly outdoors, and you're on snow and ice, it's terribly uncomfortable. Your hands, your digits, your hands and your feet are moving constantly. It's the only way you get any circulation. And uh, you lie there. You want to think of something positive. And so what did I think of? I thought of food. And you know, I've, I always understood that when you're starving, certainly even if you're hungry, don't think about food. You know, the last thing you should think about. But I did. And it's amazing what the imagination can do. When I say the mental approach, keeping mentally strong, or having some vision of a future, or something that can carry you ahead, it, it's, it's a great bulwark to staying alive. So I thought about it. And as I lie on the ground, I thought of all the favorite foods, things that my mother made, or things that I never had, but I wish I had, and all that. And they become very, very real. You can smell them. You, t you taste the foods and all that. And so that helped to keep my spirits moving forward. When I, many, many months, well, months later, when I was in the hospital and had recovered sufficiently, I wrote down, and I, I asked a nurse for, I wanted a little book. I just wanted to make a record of the foods that I thought of then to make sure my mother made those foods for me when I got home. And so I started to make a list of the foods. Uh, I came up with 84 different ones that I remembered. I look at these foods now, and you can see them afterward. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the little book here. But uh, <clears throat> remarkable, some of the things I had no idea what they were, what they tasted like, but they always sounded good. And I said, I'll put them in my book. And so I, I did. But that helped keep me alive. I should also point out that in this book, if you look at it, there are about 18 to 20 different diseases that I contracted uh, during this time. Again, when the body deteriorates, it's susceptible to all kinds of ailments. And I could read you enterocolitis, duodenitis, anemia, um, beriberi, you, you name it. Any kind of, kind of disease that would come from a weakened body, I contracted. And uh, I spent a long, many, many months in the hospital after that. But if you want, you can see this later on. While I'm uh, in my pocket, people sometimes ask, and they say, did they know that you were Jewish? And I said, the reality was that I had no intention ever of giving up my dog tags, which, said, which had a J on them, said I was Jewish, and I had the Star of David, and I had a mezuzah, and we hang on the doorposts of our home with the religious writings in, inside them and all that. I, I said, I'm, I'm going to wear them. I guess it was defiance. Defiance then, I don't know if I would be faced with the same thing today if I would do it, but certainly, again, youth has great ad advantage. I'm not suggesting to you that you should be thinking about military careers, but it does have a great advantage. And so I was defiant, and I was going to use it anyway. But as I responded to those people, it didn't really make any difference. Ideology was not a factor with them. They were given a mission. Take these people, make them work, or kill them. And uh, that was simply it. We uh, went on, continued this way <clears throat> for months. And then finally, the Allied forces had regrouped, and they were <coughs> moving the Germans back. So they had to move us a little faster and decide to put us into railroad cars. You may have seen pictures of the railroad cars in uh, 
in Germany, Poland, uh, Austria, uh, Czechoslovakia, where the concentration camps were, would carry the people to their deaths in most cases. And there was that kind of a railroad car, so there, was no win there were no windows, in them, and you were just thrown in the, into the cars. They were called 40 and eights, meaning that they would hold eight horses or 40 humans. We were stacked in there, and I figured there must have been 80, 75 to 80 people. There was no sitting room. You were stacked in there like meat. And that's the way we went for six days. Um, once a day, the door, big door would slide open. They'd throw in some crusts of bread. And we scrambled for the, for the bread. There was no buddy system then. You didn't say, oh, you know, as you, as, as you would under normal circumstances, oh, why don't you have some too? You just scrambled and got anything that you could get your hands on, and you threw it in your mouth immediately. Somebody once asked a question. They said, Mr. Max, um, would you ever want to go through again what you went through? And I said, that's, that's a very interesting question. And I said, you know, given a choice, the answer probably would be no. Of course, I wouldn't want to do that. But am I glad that I did it? And in a sense, I said, uh, yeah, I guess I am glad that I did it. I was fortunate enough to live through it because I learned so much about human nature. How easy it is to turn from a human being to an animal. Uh, and uh, that's really what happened. We became animals at that time. Some of the people lost their minds. Some of the people lost their lives during that time. After six days, that door opened. And they pulled us out, putting us on a forced march to get away from the Allied forces. I couldn't walk anymore. I had, I had frostbite and, uh, and uh, uh, my, feet, my feet were so bad, I had to take one shoe just, I just threw away. I couldn't wear a shoe anymore. And so I wasn't going to go on any forced march. And so this was the second option that I had. I said, first, the war will be over. Or second, maybe I can escape. This is a time to escape. And so with two other fellows, we figured out a way. Um, that we would do it. And so I crawled as much as I could in the forest march, just a short distance. And I said, once we make a turn, these two guards will be positioned in such a way that we'll be able to make a break for it. And we did just that. When we came to a curve in the road and the guards were stationed and there was a, there was a blind spot, we did. We threw ourselves over a hedge and uh, rolled down and then we started to crawl. I did anyway. I think they were able to walk, the other two. But I crawled and walked, and sometimes on fours, sometimes on twos. Well, we got back into this little town that we had been through earlier on the train, Reichenbach, in Germany. So we crawl into the town, and it turns out it's a Nazi staging area. So there are troops all over the place. The order had been issued, so if we were spotted, we'd be shot right on the spot there. So uh, we worked our way through alleys and uh, got to a certain point, undiscovered, and sometimes instinct takes over. And you don't know why, but I just looked into the distance and I saw a, a white house. And I said to these other two guys, that's a safe house. And, and they said, how, how do you know? I said, I know, I know. it's a safe house. So we crawled over to that house and knocked on the door. And an elderly couple lived there. First, a young, a young man came, and somebody in the background said, what's going on? They're apparently in German. And, uh, and he started to close the door on me. And the one good foot that I had, the foot I put in the door so it didn't close. And these older people come to the door. Strangely enough, you know, things happen. And, we don't know. Are these things ordained? Are we supposed to live or not live? Uh, and we don't know, but sometimes things do happen. And as the case of the German sergeant, who was probably one of the very, very few who would have allowed me to live. And then these two elderly people so happened that years earlier they had been to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
And they had warm feel they had memories of Pittsburgh and warm, warm feelings about America and about Americans. And when they saw the US emblem on the jacket I was wearing, I said, oh, there's the Americans. And so the man comes out, looks up and down, no soldiers nearby, and so he pulls us in. And they gave us some hot soup, genuine soup. And I can't tell you what it tasted like because it's indescribable. Uh, the feeling after months without having any, <laughs> any much of any food at all. And so uh, we, did, we, we did have soup, soup there. And then they said, we can't keep you here because if we're discovered with you, then we'll be killed along with you. But they did help tell us where to hide out. And uh, it meant crawling through some back alleys and in a barn. And we got to that barn, pulled ourselves up into a hayloft. The next morning, uh, I hear some scurrying around in the barn. And I look between the cracks, and I see there's a, uh, a soldier. And I, I remember, this, this, this is, one, again, one of the images that sticks with me. The, the picture of this soldier in white long, un, long underwear and black suspenders and black boots, and he's milking a cow. I stir a little, and there's a crack in the floor, and some of the straw goes, goes through, and it starts falling kind of a thing that would happen in a movie, you know? It's wondering, which way will it go? If it went in front of him, he'd know we were up there, and that probably would have been our demise. But it trickled down, and then went behind him, and he never, never noticed it. The, uh, later that night, we heard a lot of scurrying around in town. The Allied forces were very near at that point, and the Germans really vacated that area. And uh, next day, and it was hard to tell. Sometimes you can't remember days or nights or whatever. And I figured maybe, maybe we were there three days, two nights. I'm not, not sure. But the next day, we looked. There was a little crack. And we could look down an alley. And I saw, some, I saw something go by. And it looked like a GI helmet. And uh, I said that to these guys. And they said, you're delusionary. Couldn't be. We're not that close yet. And a little while later, a vehicle goes by. It's a Jeep with a white star on the hood. I said, that can only be. It's an American Jeep. And sure enough, the Americans had, had gotten to us. I was in the 6th Armored Infantry Division. This was the 3rd Armored Infantry Division patrolling that area or moving in that, in that direction. And uh, that's what it was. We rolled down out of the hayloft, down an alley. And we were the first Americans that they had come across. <clears throat> they couldn't be kind enough. They saw we were emaciated, and they said, oh, what do they need? They need food. The last thing you want to do if, you're, if you have been starving is to eat chocolate. Not good, for you. not good. And uh, they tried to stuff everything they could, including chocolate, in, into us. Fortunately, they did get me to a field hospital uh, quickly, and they cut off the bottom of my right foot. It was all black, and, and I would have lost probably Maybe days or weeks later, I probably would have lost the foot, the leg, who knows how, mu how much else. But I did get surgery in a field hospital. You're familiar with the MASH uh, program, you know, field hospital, something like that. And they did treat, treat me there, and then I went to other field hospitals, and ultimately, first general hospital in Paris. And uh, then uh, with a raging fever, because I had all these ailments, and they couldn't do anything about the fever, so they wouldn't send me to America. I was ready to go back. And finally, they got it down artificially. They got the temperature down. And they put me on a hospital plane. If you want to, if you want to travel in comfort, you know, I don't, I don't, 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 don't go through what I went through to get it. But if you can lie in a bed and travel across the Atlantic, it's a nice way to travel. So that was at least comfortable. And I did fly across the Atlantic and did uh, come to a hospital a veterans hospital at, uh, on Staten Island, Halloran General Hospital, where I spent, I had spent a, a month in uh, Europe hospitalized, then 10 months there, uh, uh, nine, months more, nine more months there. And uh, we, I was critical at first. My parents came, came to see me, and they wa walked by the room. They looked in, they walked, and they kept right on walking. 
I had lost, I had been, I had weighed about 100 to 155, and I then weighed 89 pounds. And when you become emaciated like that, you look kind of different. And so they did not recognize me. But uh, there I was, and eventually, eventually did get well enough to get out on the floor with the other veteran, veterans. And when I was well enough is when I wrote that little book, The, the Diseases and the... Uh, and the foods that I uh, had missed all that time. I mentioned at the very beginning that we were a different America at that time. I've been asked sometimes, I've been interviewed with veterans of other wars. The, the uh, <clears throat> Korean War, for example, is one there was a Korean officer and me being interviewed by the interviewer on the program. And I had described something of what we, uh, I, I just described to you, and what America was like at that point. And so the interviewer then looks to him, and she says, Colonel, she said, uh, you just heard what Mr. Max said about what the American people were like at that time. And do you think that the American people could rise to that level? ever again? And he said, absolutely. And then she, I guess, with a wise look on her face, she, was, she knew there would be some response. She looked at me and she said, what do you think about that, Mr. Max? And I said, I wish that were true. And I hope that it is true. I hope, first of all, that we never have to face these circumstances again. And if we were ever forced to do so, I would hope that the American people will. I'm just not that certain that it can happen again. It was a country that was so united, mind you, we had been through World War I. And America was not ready for, for an, uh, another war. And again, we thought we were totally isolated. We have oceans on both sides. Who's going to attack this nation? And we're a strong nation, even though we were, we were still in the Depression. Uh, so who's going to attack us? But again, from what I mentioned earlier, you understand that they ultimately we were, it was forced up, up, upon us. But what happened to the veterans after, when we came back, that's what was so, so amazing. During the war, everyone had a role. I remember my father was an air, a, a, an air, uh, air raid warden. An air raid warden. You weren't here at that time. No. But he was an air raid warden. And when we exchanged letters when I was overseas, my mother would often tell me, oh, your dad's out paroling, patrolling neighborhoods, South Orange, New Jersey. Now, you know, no, nobody's going to attack South Orange, New Jersey. But he was out there, and he kept his helmet in the back of the car all the time. And every night he would go out and he'd patrol the streets looking for enemy aircraft. Uh, my, my mother did sewing. You know, you've heard the stories about Rosie the Riveter. Women went to work in the factories to take the places of the men so they could go to wage war. And everybody had something to do. But significantly, everybody had to sacrifice something. I mean, we could no longer create or make tires, automobiles, silk stockings, butter, most meats, gasoline. They weren't available. Some were rationed, and some just weren't available at all. And I don't remember hearing that there was anybody complaining at that time. Everybody was willing to make the sacrifice for our troops over there. We used to get all kinds of Red Cross packages and everything. But when we came back, we were, we were all, whether we we're heroes or not, the point is that you served. And uh, you, uh, when, I, when we were able to get up, when I was able to join the others and we got up, they would take us all over New York. Uh, theater, Madison Square Garden, the box, boxing matches, basketball games, Yankee Stadium, and always with our red robes. And now, you know, we played the national anthem, and I don't recall if it was before or after, or in place of national anthem, but at some point, the announcer would, would announce, and here are our American heroes, <laughs> and we would all stand up, and they would roar. People would rise in their seats and just roar and cheer. They just couldn't do, couldn't do enough. I had a regular seat at uh, um, Carnegie Hall in New York on like symphonic music. And so some family gave up their box and I had a box right over the orchestra every Thursday night. When they couldn't put 
f put any weight on me. They decided they had a way of doing it. In the hospital, they couldn't. Uh, they gave me so many pills that I, I couldn't take any food, so I wasn't gaining any weight. But there was a famous resort in the, uh, in the uh, yes. Catskill Mountains in New York called Grossinger's, famous for its food. And Jenny Grossinger was like many, many others, willing to do all she could. And so she had an arrangement with the military hospitals to have their, their service people come there and spend a week. They sent me there, and it was such a great experience. I gained, and I gained so much weight. I came back. I was weighed, and the, when I remember one of the doctors saying, my gosh, Jenny Grosser, Grossinger can do more than all the doctors and all the pills in this hospital. So he goes back for another week. And those were the kind of things that people did for Americans. I remember I, after I, I was well enough, I was invited to be, be on a network radio show. No television at the time. And uh, I got awarded prizes. And uh, it was just a great, great experience. So what I'm, what, what I'm saying is that war is a terrible thing. The Holocaust, worse yet, because it's a definitive plan to eliminate a body of people. And for, 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 for no reason other, other than prejudice it's, itself. And so the message that I really want to leave with you, I would ask, first of all, that you try to internalize just a little, to get the feeling of what happens when a great, when a great, when a dictator, the likes of an Adolf Hitler, and there are other potentials in this world, and there, and there probably will be for a long, long time. But one can recognize that there is something like, like that that is coming. We want to remember what the consequences of that are. We want to remember what can happen to any of us, to family, to anybody, when, when one of these dictators is turned loose. So I ask you to try to internalize and feel because all I've given you is some own my own personal impressions and some of the things that happened. But if you can try to think, though, what it must be like and why we don't want to go through anything like that ever again, then that helps prevent it from happening in the future. The whole idea, the whole thought here of remembering the Holocaust is to recognize when dictators, forces that are going to take extreme power and exercise that power over un people unwilling or, or who unnecessarily should have to give their lives. And we want to recognize it and rise up as the American people are always capable of doing. So I ask again that you remember <coughs> that these things do happen. You did it. You heard from one of the, f one of the declining eyewitnesses of these. I do go out frequently with people who survive concentration camps and devastating, where again, you know, as I mentioned, 18 million lives were sacrificed, people killed simply because they were Jews. And so uh, we want to remember. And I ask that you think and do remember, you know, what, what just transpired here and what the emotions I've tried to get across to you. And so that you talk with other people because numbers are very, very important. And so when you're home, again, you talk to your parents, you talk to your siblings and all that. You talk to the students tomorrow who weren't here tonight and share with them some of the, some of the things that you heard that happened some time ago. And we want to make sure they never happen again. So I hope you will always remember what it is that I've tried to impart to you, and you'll talk with others, keep, it, keep the memory of that alive. And that 30, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you'll still remember it and still recognize it if it comes onto the scene again. And so I do thank you for listening to this. And uh, I think, can we take questions?
Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for some questions about is there anything you would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Any question at all? Yes. Not even relating to the way that people responded to the veterans, but just the war effort in general. Why don't we see that now? We're involved in multiple wars right now. Nobody's selling war bonds. Nobody's doing any of that stuff, all those things that you talked about. That is a basic difference in the nature of our leadership in the country and I think the people themselves. When we entered the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war first and then, and then shifted over to Iraq, when we did, the administration in this country had as its aim to prove to them that they're not going to disrupt, disrupt the American lives. We were not asked, we were intentionally not asked to do anything to support the war effort because we wanted to demonstrate to them. Our military will take care of it, don't worry. But um, you're not going to disrupt, disrupt the lives that Americans live. Many, many will agree with what, what, what I feel. It was totally the wrong thing to do. If a nation, if you're sending any of your, your men and women off to war, it's an absolute obligation, I believe, to support them in every way possible. If it means sacrifice, then you do that. Because presumably the, the war is being waged in the interest of your nation and in opposition to some, some force that is counter to the interest of this nation. And so we must support them. You're absolutely right. We have done nothing. And I think the, the people who were most victimized by this were those veterans in the Vietnam War. And I remember when they came back, some of you may remember that too, that what did some Americans do? They spit on them. Spit on them. You were in a war that we didn't belong to. Well, it wasn't their fault. They were sent over there to do it. And so you're right. And I hope if we ever face a war again, that the nation will rise again to that, to that level. And it says, a much, it says much to the enemy that you're not just fighting these, these soldiers or these sailors, you're fighting an entire nation. Good point, very good point. Okay, uh-huh, uh yes. Yes. So were you still in the same clothes? Mm -hmm. I have two answers to that. Number one, yes, yes, I was in the uh, same clothes, and they were they were they were rags. I mean, you know, I just had a regular army jacket on, and it was torn and all that, but the emblem was still there, and so yes, I did change my clothes, but it's also an answer to my wife, who says, if I don't, if I ever ever put on a shirt a second time, she says, you can't do that. And I said, well, you forget. I went six, 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 uh, six months or more without ever changing anything at all. And somehow, somehow you learn to live through it. You know? That was a good point. Uh, yes. Was there any single idea or belief that uh, kept you motivated to keep going? Motivated to sustain life or to win? Just not to give up. Not to give up. Yeah, I think, you know, many, we all have different mental, mental ways in which we deal with life. And uh, same pe some people are fortunate to have a positive outlook. Think in our lives now, too, some of the people we know. I always see the positive side of things. Other people always see the neg negative side. The only way you could survive, really, under the circumstances and the conditions through which I, I did survive was with that positive attitude. And uh, the question does come up periodically, did, did, was there a point at which you gave up? And I don't remember any time doing that. I think my youth had a great deal to do with it. If I were faced with that condition now, I doubt that I would have the same positive attitude. But I always continued to think that someday I will be back, be with family, be back to the people I knew at college, and on all of that, and someday I will eat these wonderful foods. And that's what, you know, sometimes it's artificial. In a, in a sense, that is, that was artificial. I, I constructed something that would help give me a reason for remaining alive. 
And I always thought that sometime I might escape, and ultimately that, that was the route that I followed. So it's possible to do it, but again, each mental attitude might be different. So for some people, it might not have been possible. For me, I don't remember ever giving up the thought of carrying on. Good. Yes, when you first came back, did you, let's say in the first five or 10 years, share those experiences with your friends and families, or did you, were you quiet about it, or as free as you are now? Mm -hmm. For 53 years, I never talked about it. And I'm not sure why. I do know that many veterans just blocked out, never wanted to talk about the experiences they went through. It wasn't that kind of blockage for me, but I just didn't think that there was anything that really was reportable. Uh, and so I didn't talk. And one day I was sitting on the couch in our den, and I had two little young grandsons, and one of them started to ask, said, said Poppy, were you in the war? I said, World War II? I said, yes. And he started asking questions. How old was, uh, I mean, about five or seven? Five, five, five or six. And, uh, and he says, uh, well, where did you sleep? What did you eat? Did you carry a gun? Did you ever fire a gun? Did you ever kill anyone? And then all of a sudden, it hit me. I said, my gosh, you know, I did go through all these things, and yet nobody will ever know it unless I start to, to write about it or talk about it. And then I came across the Holocaust Commission in our, in our Jewish community. Holocaust education, as you may know, in New Jersey is mandated just as it was important for me to share that story with you, it is important for every student in New Jersey to know and to remember what did and what can happen and all that. But uh, I then recognized that these people had the mission that I was trying to share with you tonight. These people who survived concentration camps, lost most of the members of their family, blatantly, boldly, just slaughtered, killed, and all that. And I said, and so the head of our Holocaust Commission said, well, your story is in a way similar. You were a slave laborer in uh, Germany, so you lived the same things that they did. And you were threatened with death all the time and all that. But anyway, I then recognized that there they, they were there on a mission. And that should be my mission too. And so when Dr. Shapiro asked me to come out here, I said, yes, I want, want to do that because that's part of the mission. Otherwise, I think you heard something here tonight, you witnessed something that you might not have had an opportunity to know about. And I think you can answer a lot of people who are doubters and all. But uh, it became a mission after a while to do that. But I still do come across veterans who have never talked about it and they do block it out of their minds. And I understand why. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, before I ask my question, I'd just like to make a comment. I was born in 1940. So I was uh, five years old when the uh, Second World War came to an end. And I am a Vietnam era veteran. I never served in Vietnam. Uh, anybody who served uh, with the Allied forces in World War II is an automatic hero of mine because of any war. The clearly defined good and evil, it was World War II. So anybody who served in Alpha with the Allied forces of World War II is an automatic hero of mine. So you, sir, are a hero of mine. <laughs> uh, Thank now, you. I, I would Thank like you. To, uh, to ask my question. Unfortunately, there are many people in this world who are Holocaust deniers, perhaps the most prominent one of which is the president of Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. And as you indicated, uh, many people who uh, survive the concentration camps are not going to be with us too much longer. And they are living proof that the Holocaust actually occurred. What can we do okay. to 
to mm -hmm. let people know that the Holocaust really did occur uh, when people like you uh, are no longer with us. Okay, there is more than sufficient documentation. One thing that was discovered a few, not too many years back, it was a town in Germany called Bad Arolsen, B-A-D-A-R-O-L-S-E-N. When well, they discovered that there were 50 million documents on 16 miles of shelves, many of which had Nazi officer signatures on them. When the so at the, end, at the end of the war, when the military started to come through the concentration camps, they gathered, they gathered materials, documentation, in some of the concentration camps that were still there. It was all brought together at Bad Arolsen. These are reports of internees, names, family names, and lots of other information about people, many of whom became uh, occupants in the concentration camps, many of whom were killed. There are reports in there of the surger surgeries that were done. Remember the, the, the fam famous uh, Nazi doctor, I'm trying to remember his name. Huh? Dr. Mengele performed, they used these Jewish bodies to perform all kinds of operations, to experiment and all that. But all that kind of stuff is documented. So here are these 50 million documents. They're stuck away in a little town in Germany. It took a number of years. The Red Cross was instrumental in doing it. And then the, Hol the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, through the Red Cross, was able to procure all of those documents. So anybody who, who says that it never happened, the, I, take them. Take them. Pay for them. I said, I'll take you on a trip. I want you to come to Washington with me. I want you to go to this museum. I want you to look at those documents. They've been authenticated with Nazi signatures on them. They list people by names and what was done with them. And uh, then if they still deny it, then you say, well, you're not legitimate. You're totally illegitimate because you're not even willing to look yourself. And you're, doing, you're just taking some propaganda that is totally false. It did happen. And you have the opportunity to see it. And you're giving up that opportunity. I mean, ridicule them for, for not wanting to look further. In, in most cases, it, it's, it's anti-Semitism, the, den the denial. You just don't want to accept the fact. You know. the last huh? question. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. I just want to fill in a little bit about that Aronson. It wasn't until a very few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, that those records were finally allowed to be released. They were there, right. everybody knew about it. When people, when survivors wanted to trace their families, they always wrote to the Red Cross, and they were forever getting nowhere. They were reaching dead ends and dead ends because 11 countries had to sign off on that. Mm -hmm. And Germany was the last one that finally signed off on it all of five or six years ago. Right. So a lot of people died without ever receiving the information that they were dying to get to find out if they had any, any you know, living relatives in the world. And there was a very interesting 60 Minutes segment we showed when the um, archives were first opened about Arlson. They brought three survivors over whose records they had found there. And one of them, it was just astonishing to see that when he saw the records, it turned out that he was actually supposed to be transported to the crematoria. And for no reason that anybody could figure out, his name was crossed off that list and put on another list. Mm. And when he saw that, he literally broke down in front of the camera. Mm. That's one thing. And the second comment is, and I'm sorry, you know, but I just have to tell Good. you that um, several years ago, there was a conference right here at the university on Ravensbrück, which was a very brutal concentration camp that was built for women, um, almost strictly for women only, of all faiths. In fact, the minority of women there were Jewish. But one of the most interesting things was that in interviewing survivors of Ravensbrück, they said over and over, in fact, we had some of the recipes, they discussed food 
It really helped them at night. They discussed food and they discussed the memories of home and the, the meals and they would share that with one another. Mm -hmm. There's also um, one of the very first books that was ever published was by Yafa Eliyach called Hasidic uh, Tales of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. where she trained students at Brooklyn College to go out and interview survivors in, in the New York area. And many of their memories of survival also shared stories of concentrating, you know, remembering a, a celebration of a holiday and the smells and the taste of food. So it's very, very interesting mm. that that kept you alive as well. Thank you. All points well made. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank uh, Robert Max for coming here, and it's been our pleasure and honor to host you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.